Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. And I have with me today as my guests, uh, two gentlemen from the administrative staff at uh, Montserrat College. And I have with me Kurt Steinberg, who is the president of Montserrat College. Kurt, welcome. Thank you, thanks for having me. Yeah, and I have Brian Pellinen, who is the Dean of Academic Affairs. Did I get that right? You did, thank you. Okay. <laughs> and um, as, as our viewers know, um, this time of fall, uh, school, schools, whether they're, they're, they're primary schools or secondary schools or colleges, are wrestling uh, uh, with opening, reopening in the fall, and in uh, what, what uh, 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 whether they do hybrid or they do in-class instruction or remote. So everybody's uh, wrestling with that. So we want to talk to, uh, to these two folks to see what, uh, uh, what Montserrat College of Art has, uh, has planned for the, for the fall. But uh, before I start, maybe um, one of you, uh, Kurt, could just for those of our viewers who aren't familiar with Montserrat College of Art, maybe you could just give us a quick thumbnail picture of, of Montserrat. Who are you and, you know, uh, your, your position in Beverly and et cetera, what, what you teach. Sure. I think um, we're uh, Montserrat College of Art, you know, founded in 1970. Uh, we were originally up at the North Shore Music Theater. In fact, we were originally part of that whole group and we were connected. Um, at one point, uh, we decided uh, both to split uh, into two separate uh, 501c3s and uh, we then a little bit later around that time moved downtown. And so we're, our main building is the Hardy building. So a lot of people from, from Beverly who've been there for a while know that building right next to the common uh, in Beverly. And we occupy uh, quite a bit of space along Cabot Street as well. So the college itself is actually very, very much anchored into the downtown of the city of Beverly. Um, and we're a major economic driver. We bring about $27 million worth of economic impact to the city of Beverly. We've got about 400 students. Um, they uh, study both uh, design, media arts, and fine arts. And in fact, uh, the vast majority of our students, so we were originally a fine arts college, um, but over the last 50 years, uh, we have really become more of a media arts and design institution with almost 75% of our students uh, in, those, in those disciplines. Um, so what I mean by that is we're more of uh, animation uh, and, um, and 2D and 3D design um, uh, school right now uh, with graphic design and visual communications also being, being a big part of what we do. All right. Very good, well, well said. Okay, Brian, did you get that all right? You got it right. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, um, let, me, let me ask you, uh, what, what are your current plans for reopening in the fall? Yeah, I think um, I'll take the first part of that. And I think actually, uh, Brian can talk a little bit more about what we're doing in the classroom. Our, our faculty have just been absolutely outstanding with the way they have been really imaginative uh, and trying to create real quality of experiences for our students. So right now, uh, you you know, your viewers have probably heard this word, you know, batted around, which is hybrid. I will let Brian sort of explain what that means, but that's the, that's the main, I think, delivery mechanism. Uh, our classes are starting on September 2nd. Uh, move in for our students uh, will be the weekend before that. Uh, we're doing it by appointment, so we won't have the same sort of influx of students all at once. We're actually measuring that out over a two to three day period where they have to come in at a certain time and they get a certain amount of time to move in. And we're gonna be really strict about that. Um, at the same time, uh, we're in the middle of doing orientation for our freshmen, uh, but that is actually all virtual. So we, we're doing that all through uh, our uh, on-campus uh, program called Canvas, uh, which is also their, their learning management tool going into the year. Uh, so they're going to also, through orientation, get acquainted uh, with that. Um, and then there's also an opportunity to take uh, online classes as well. So we are doing all those things. We, um, what we call de-densified. So we actually um, decreased by about 10% the amount of students we were allowing into housing, of housing we control. 
We then contracted actually with Beverly Crossing, a great partner of ours down on Rantoul Street, uh, where that 10% of the group is actually going to be moving to. And again, it's, a, it's about creating, um, uh, you know, household groups that we can track. Um, I'll, I can get into more about the details of that, but um, just for now, that's sort of the overview. And we will be, just so people know, we have been very much uh, engaged in conversations with Endicott College, uh, making sure that both institutions in Beverly are doing a lot of the same sorts of things um, around testing and tracing, which I know our community concerns. Um, we are being very serious about that. Uh, there are over 100 institutions, uh, colleges that are engaged with the Broad Institute, which actually is a promising 24-hour turnaround on test results. Uh, we've contracted with them, uh, and they also have a very high uh, accuracy rate as well. So we're really happy with that. Uh, the tracing, I couldn't say more about the Board of Health in Beverly. They have been nothing but really great partners in the conversations that our full-time nurse has been having, our student affairs people have been having. Uh, and we've just been engaged in really good practices and learning as much as we can to make the place as safe as possible, not just for our students, but also our faculty, staff. And I think it's really important for the community to know that they've been part of our decision making as well, because we understand the responsibility of bringing an influx of people into the community. And we want to make sure that everybody is safe. The number one way we're doing it, and this is where I'll, I'll end on this, is um, we are absolutely enforcing social distancing and mask wearing on campus. Uh, outside your apartments, if you are not wearing a mask, you do not get to go to class, and you will absolutely get it pointed out to you. Um, we are also making sure that everyone understands what the Beverly Salem area rules are about going into the neighborhoods, going to the businesses, and we will absolutely be partnering with businesses to make sure that our students, our staff, and our faculty are adhering to all the local ordinances. It is incredibly important that we do that and that we have a community approach. We know that we're part of the group and we need to make sure that we're good citizens. So I I just, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. What, what, what part of your uh, enrollment, what percentage of your enrollment uh, live in campus housing? So traditionally, uh, somewhere between 80 and 85 percent um, uh, live on campus. We're going to have uh, actually a very similar number uh, going in. I mean, one of the surprising and great things that says a lot about, I think, the quality of the education is that um, we have a, a retention rate of over 90 percent uh, going into the fall. And we also have a, a very good I think retention rate are in, uh, on our incoming class as well. And we've, because we're a small school, which is by design, um, you know, Brian and his team have been able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with our students, which has been really, really important about making them feel safe, but also getting feedback from them about our plans and modifying them in some cases based on things that, you know, we hadn't really thought about. So it's been a real community event trying to get ready. Now, when you, when you say retention, do you mean uh, that incoming freshmen and, and they go out as seniors and graduate? Is that what you mean by retention? Yeah, what I mean by that is sort of like, you know, what we thought our original class was going to be. We've held on to uh, a pretty high percentage of them. And then when you go, when I talk about retention in higher ed, it's, it's uh, how many freshmen became sophomores and came back, how many sophomores became juniors okay. and came back. Yeah. You know, that's how we measure success. And let me tell you, any college, that can be in the 90s, even in a regular normal time, that is a great number. Yeah. And you say your, uh, your current enrollment is about 400, you're expecting 400 students in, in the it's fall? A, it's around 400 students, yeah, on average. And how has that, how has that gone, let's say, in the last decade? What, what's, how has that number changed or adjusted in the last decade? I'd say that in the, in the last decade, um, it has fluctuated a little bit. It has gone into the 300s but it's been on its way back up. A few years ago when the college was talking with Salem, uh, we saw some decreases in enrollment, you know, because there was uncertainty, uh, but we've started to actually bounce back to pre-Salem numbers. Honestly, the college has actually seen pretty steady and firm growth in the last few years. Yeah, it's been, it's been steady growth for the last five, five to yeah. seven years, really. 
Brian, now, what, what, from how far uh, uh, away do your students come? I mean, do you have students coming in from California, say, or Florida, or uh, what, what's, uh, what's kind of like the area that they really yeah. come from? Yeah, 75% of the students that come to Montserrat are, are from the New England region. Um, okay. Most of our students are from Massachusetts, but we get a fair number uh, also from Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, like a lot of schools in New England, we get a fair number of students from New York and New Jersey. Um, so just that, that region, New England plus New York, New Jersey, accounts for probably 90% of what we do. Um, and then there's 10% of our students. We have some international students, some students from Florida, Texas, California, but a lot of students from the mid-Atlantic, a lot of students from Ohio, uh, Maryland, places like that. Now, um, we, we talked about the student housing and people, people coming in. Now, I understand you've done some modifications in terms of the classroom settings and spacing and capacity, you've reconfigured some of your spaces. T tell us about that. Yeah, um, I think to get to where we are in the fall, we need to understand what happened in the spring. Um, and for us, I, I, I can't speak highly enough about our faculty and our students and how quickly they were able to change to a, a new way of teaching and learning. Um, for those unfamiliar with an art and design education, it's really a unique experience. Um, you know, people often think of their own college experience. And if you went to a liberal arts school or a large university, you, you miss a lot of what we do in, in an art and design place. Um, so much of our, our education is, is hands-on learning. It's students in the sculpture shop. It's in the printmaking lab. It's in a painting studio. And those are really hard to replicate online. Um, but our faculty and our students did a magnificent job, uh, really, from April to finish the semester. But we knew from that experience that our students really wanted to be on campus as much as possible. And so all summer, we've been monitoring the health situation. We've been looking at ways to, I think the, the, the term Kurt used, de-densify uh, our campus was really important. Um, art studios in general tend to be big spaces. Um, Montserrat and the, the size of the college we are, the largest class we ever have, and this is like with our art history classes, some of our liberal arts classes, are 20 students. So we don't have the, the 100, 200 person lecture halls. That's just never been part of the type of education we do. So we went through uh, all the course registrations, all the classes on the schedule, um, and, and a combination of uh, some classes that remain in person. Some are hybrid classes, which means the faculty will either be in camp on campus one day and the rest of the class is online. Um, we have some courses that we've basically cut the class in half. I'm teaching a class uh, in the fall where half of my students will come on, on Tuesday, while the other half will be remote. And then on Thursday, they'll flip-flop, so the ones that were there. Um, so they're still getting access to their faculty, they're still getting access to their studios, and they're still getting all of the learning contact hours via online. And then about 20% of our courses uh, in the fall semester will be fully remote. Now, I read somewhere an article recently that you were uh, going to make use of webcams uh, in some of the students. Tell, tell, tell us about that, that sounds fascinating. Yeah, so every one of our classrooms uh, is, is equipped this semester with a webcam and projection capability. And what that allows us to do is students that uh, say they're not feeling well, we want them to stay home, stay safe. Um, everyone will have a chance, regardless of whether they're on campus or off campus, to be in the room while the professors are there. Uh, at the same time, professors, we want them to be safe too. And so if they're not feeling well, they can stay home uh, with the projection capability in the classroom and the students there. So the faculty member will see all the students in class and can teach remotely. Now, you, you mentioned that uh, you've been in contact with Endicott College uh, and what, what some of the other schools, Gordon or Salem State, have you kind of bounced ideas off of those institutions as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, um, I've been, uh, we're part of the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities in Massachusetts. And so, um, we have, a, we have a call amongst all the presidents, actually, in Massachusetts of private institutions every Friday. Uh, but in between, uh, I know I've been in contact with my colleagues at, uh, at Gordon, at Merrimack, uh, but Endicott, because we're in the same city, you know, we've been talking a lot more. And then on the public side, you know, uh, President Keenan over at Salem State has been somebody that we've been also talking with. Uh, and just, you know, making sure that we're approaching our communities in similar fashions. So I think that's really the main part. And then they learn things, and then I learn things, and we're able to sort of put this together. Because the one thing I think we realize is there is no, there's no playbook on this thing. You know, I mean, this is a, a unique 
moment and our response is unique. And so we've really been leaning on each other uh, and, and learning constantly and sharing. And that's not just me, but I know Brian has been in touch with colleagues within uh, us, but also our art association, our art college association that we belong to, which is na nationwide. And uh, our student affairs people have been talking to their colleagues as well. So I have been really amazed, honestly, and I can, I can talk for Massachusetts specifically at how much uh, we've all sort of banded together mm -hmm. to approach this without any sense of competition, without any, and none of that even gets in the way. It's about making sure we're all healthy, safe, and we're doing the right thing for our students. And so the openness to share even documents and, and, and approaches and all sorts of things and being open about costs and all those kinds of things has really, really been quite amazing and really, really wonderful. Yeah. Now, I understand you, you talked about dorms before. Now, I, I know that you are currently building out some more space uh, in downtown yes. Beverly. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, uh, above what um, was called uh, the City Diner, that's what people know it as, City side, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, city side, which is now City Eats, I think they're calling it. Yeah, um, been, so I, been I, there I, many times. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so we are actually working with Peter Lutz and his uh, development group who own the building uh, to take about 10,000 square feet, so about 43 beds, which is the upper portion of, of that building that goes about half a block. Um, and we're, uh, we're building apartment-style housing from scratch uh, up there. Um, and it will, uh, the entrance is actually on Knowlton Street, where the old taxi service used to be. Uh, and we're actually building a new, um, a, a new gallery, uh, which will be in the entrance. And then an elevator. These will be totally ADA compliant and accessible uh, spaces. We need, had a need to increase that on campus if we're being responsible uh, to our community but also upgrading our residence halls in general. Uh, that's been a big push since I got here. Uh, we also did a big makeover of one of our larger residence halls uh, on 4244 Essex Street as well. So when the students come back, they're gonna have newer space that they'll be moving into. It's just been a real push for us. Now, does that mean that you're, uh, the, the increased uh, uh, dorm space, if you will, does that mean you're expecting higher enrollments in the future or are you just gonna reconfigure where you put people or? We're, we're reconfiguring, it's around increasing the quality of the living spaces. It's something that um, I think we've identified as a group during our strategic planning is necessary and important. Uh, we just passed our strategic plan back in April after a community conversation around that, which Brian led um, in an incredible outcome, I think for us during a tough time. Um, but it's, it's really about uh, increasing the quality of what we have and then being able to have flexibility also in the summer. One of our problems, not to bore everybody with the details here, but one of our issues was is we were very tight. So we did not have a lot of downtime for our residence hall spaces. This actually allows us in the summer to take things offline and to do just maintenance and care that really needs to be done. Uh, so it's not about a big growth plan. Do we want to increase enrollment uh, over time? Yeah, a little bit, but honestly, not too much more because we stop being who we really are. Um, when you get into the mid 500s to 600 range, uh, you have to size up your other services to a point where you start to sort of that intimacy that is Montserrat that actually is a really a big selling point uh, for us. And we've been reminded during the pandemic how important it is to, and what an advantage it is to be small. Um, we we want to stay there. So I can say that anyone who's uh, worried about us encroaching or blowing up into this huge size, uh, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's not, that's not in the cards. It, it would betray sort of what I think the value that we add to our design education. Now, uh, you mentioned a number, what was it, 20, 20 million, the economic impact? 27, $27 million economic impact. 27 million. Impact. Now, I'm kind of I'm kind of curious, wh how, how did you kind of build up to that number? How did you get that number figured out? Sure. So we hired a third party to do so. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, what they, um, so what they did is they really looked at, I think, one, our, our overall budget, but then they looked at how many students we have. They mapped out sort of where do people spend, both staff and faculty, 
we don't have a we don't have a, a cafeteria, nor will we be getting one anytime soon. Um, and we're all apartment style housing. So they looked at all those things. They looked at the potential average spend of each individual based on this, the economics of, of the region. Uh, and they mapped that out. We also, uh, they, they looked at um, where people were working. So obviously we also have the staff and the faculty and what their impact is as a worker on the downtown. But also our students work in the businesses up and down Cabot Street. Uh, yeah. Or they're interning across the region, at least in Salem and the contiguous uh, cities and towns. And that's how they, they sort of measure that and they come up with that. So well, uh, give me an idea for our viewers. What, what kind of careers have uh, uh, Montserrat College of Arts students gone, gotten into in the last decade or so? Do you, you, you probably keep statistics on that. Yeah, absolutely. I'd let, let Brian sort of talk with, uh, to that and more intimately uh, involved with those kinds of things. Career services sits underneath him, so I'll let him sort of talk about it. Yeah, so Kurt mentioned um, earlier just the, how the interests of our students have changed really over the last 10, 15 years and seeing more and more of our students in that design visual communication space. Um, we have a lot of students who are graduating in, in illustration, graphic design, animation. Um, and for a number of our students, those are direct career paths. So some of them end up in the animation industry. In the past, we've had students that go on and work for Pixar and Disney and Nickelodeon. Um, but there's also this way I think people need to understand the transferability of the creative skills as much as anything. Uh, what students get at Montserrat is, is an understanding of the creative process. Um, and there's been so much made in the last few years around the creative economy. Um, and I know Kurt sits on a, a number of North Shore boards that talks about this. Um, Kurt, what was the, the number in Massachusetts alone that's like creative economic drivers? I don't remember. Um, well, the, uh, I mean, the overall uh, number for the country is in the 800 million range as far as the, the economic impact of creative uh, industries. Um, and it's a significant, it actually has a greater impact than, than agriculture on the, the national gross domestic product uh, as far as that is concerned. So it's a, uh, it's a powerful driver in the national economy and actually in, the, uh, in Massachusetts, uh, it's tens of millions of dollars. I think it's in the fifties. If I'm, and don't quote me on that, but I believe it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty up there and it's surprisingly impactful. Um, the, um, and we also have people, uh, uh, honestly, one of the things that I think people forget about is other industries count our graduates. So financial services is counting our graduates. Mm -hmm. You, you know, those things you get in the mail from fidelity and, and state street and all that stuff. Somebody actually had to design that pamphlet because I can tell you right now, the MBA that came up with that, uh, with that uh, financial product has absolutely no idea how to talk to you about it. <laughs> so, right. so our graduates, you know, in visual communications, graphic design that most people will call it, um, you know, have to, cr have to be able to be the interpreters of that information so that you as a consumer know what Fidelity is talking about when they're trying to sell you shares and, you know, the Contra Fund or Magellan or something of that nature. Um, so those are, that, that's, that's a creative person that is right there helping you out, trying to get you to understand uh, and break down complex issues. So, yeah. And so the, the, um, the students... Go ahead. That, yeah, go ahead. Go, no, no, I was... Go oh, ahead. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, the, so there are those students that go uh, also, you know, we, we do have a fair number of, of graduates in the fine arts and the studio arts, and many of them go on to, to have careers in galleries and museums. Um, and then there's, there's other students that come here and really find their footing as an academic, right? The thing that brought them to an art design school is their passion for art and design, but then they get here and our students graduate with a bachelor's degree like anyone else and they have to take English classes and history classes and science classes. And so they'll go to graduate school, sometimes in art and design, but often in education. We've had students um, go on to Columbia to go to Yale, um, some to study art and design, but others to study art history, uh, sociology, therapy, uh, psychology. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the things that um, I thought was, was great is we, we met up with an alum recently, and she heads up art therapy uh, for uh, the federal VA down in New Bedford. And um, um, we're actually going to be doing some really great things, I think, with Beverly Veterans in the fall through her uh, in our printmaking uh, space. And um, so they do all sorts of things. She graduated with a fine arts degree, went on to get in graduate, graduate school in art therapy, 
uh, and is really doing great things. And she herself actually is a veteran, uh, Army veteran, and is uh, really giving back in a really substantial way. It was great to meet her. So we, we're, we're all over the place. Our graduates are in every little nook and cranny of the economy. Yeah, and, and you've got such a, a great symbiotic relationship here with, uh, with the community and with, with Beverly. You know, everybody knows about uh, Montserrat College of Art. So let's just to, to, to recap for our, for our viewers, your, your opening, uh, give us the dates again that you're reopening and, and uh, tell us about the hybrid and what, what exactly you have in mind again, if you yep. could just so, recap that. Yep. So everybody um, uh, starts moving in on August 28th. Um, classes start on September 2nd. And uh, I'll let Brian talk a little bit about the delivery. Yeah, so 20% uh, of our classes are fully online. Um, other, other classes are in that kind of AB model where half the students will be in the class half the time. Um, the other the other section of classes are are hybrid. So um, we're making sure that there's room in all of the classrooms. Everyone's wearing masks. Um, there's there's at least six feet around all of our students and all of the studio spaces. Um, and so we're just we're happy to have the students back. All right. Well, uh, that's about all the time we have for my 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 little alarm here is just about to uh, <laughs> to go off. But uh, I'd like to. Um, Thank my guests today from uh, Montserrat College of Art here in Beverly, uh, Kurt Steinberg, the president, and uh, Brian Pellinen, who is the Dean of Academic Affairs. Did I get that right? You did, twice. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, well, thank you, gentlemen. And I'd like to remind our viewers that you've been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>